Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the keynote address officially opening our special conference on disability and international humanitarian law. My name is Anne Fitzgerald, the director of the Ball Silly School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Today, I am delighted to welcome everyone to this online event held in partnership between the Ball Silly School, the Canadian Red Cross, Conrad Grebel University College at the University of Waterloo, Project Plowshares, and Wilfrid Laurier University. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those of you in the audience who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take to advance reconciliation between settler and Indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging the land is the process of deliberately naming that this is Indigenous land and Indigenous people have rights to this land. The Balsili School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldimand Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that we here at the Balsili School acknowledge the land upon which we are situated in everything that we do, including this evening's keynote lecture and tomorrow's conference, which I hope everyone watching this evening plans on attending. This is the fifth year that we have held this conference. As you're all well aware, this year is slightly different. Instead of coming together in person to share ideas with each other and to enjoy each other's company, today our conference's keynote speech is being held under other different conditions and trying times. The COVID-19 pandemic and recent concerns over its second wave have forced us to meet online through our computer screens instead of at the Balsili School. However, based on the number of participants and viewers, I can now see tuning into the event right now. This has certainly not dampened any enthusiasm to meet, nor our drive to learn more about tonight's important topic of discussion, how disability is affected by war and conflict and what we can do together to strengthen these growing mechanisms of international humanitarian law. We live in uncertain times, economically, socially, climactically, and politically. This instability foments conflict in many regions of the world, and with conflict often comes violence, persecution, and death. Light in the darkness of war has shone, however, as humanitarian concerns protecting civilians and non-combatants of war have become increasingly entrenched as rules and norms governing states in our international society. From the Con Geneva Conventions to the 1997 Ottawa Convention, the protection of non-combatants and restriction of certain means and methods of warfare through the work of scholars, activists, NGOs, policymakers and those fighting for peace and awareness, we see growing signals of progress and clearer paths towards peace for all types of bodies and peoples. However, despite advances in international humanitarian rights laws, there remains a gap or lacuna when it comes to people with disabilities. In 2006, the United Nations adopted the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities, the CRPD, providing a binding treaty protecting the rights of people with disabilities during war. Today, the extent to which this convention is obeyed under varying circumstances of time, space, and forms of conflict must give us pause, and in some cases concern as to whether it is properly or effectively enacted or even understood. It is for this reason that I am greatly honored this evening to introduce to you the keynote speaker for our conference this week and for this evening's talk. Professor Arlene Cantor, who will be delivering an address entitled, Do Human Rights Treaties Matter? Making the Case for the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. 
Professor Cantor is the Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith Professor at Syracuse University's College of Law. She is the founder and director of the College of Law's Disability Law and Policy Program and the faculty director of international programs at Syracuse University. Professor Cantor is an internationally acclaimed expert in international and comparative disability law. Her recent book, The Development of Disability Rights Under International Law, From Charity to Human Rights, traces the development of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the CPRD. We are delighted to have Professor Cantor here with us this evening. One quick house no a housekeeping note before we begin. Closed captioning for this evening's speech is available, is being recorded and will be posted to both the BSIA and Red Cross YouTube channels later this week. Any audience member can ask questions to our keynote speaker using the Q&A function at the bottom of their Zoom panel. And the moderator would be happy to verbalize these questions for our keynote. It is with great honor and thanks that I now give the floor to our keynote speaker to open this year's conference. Please allow me to welcome to you, Professor Arlene Cantor, Arlene Cantor, a warm welcome to the Balsillie School of International Affairs. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm just going to share my screen now and put up a PowerPoint that I hope everyone will be able to see. OK. Can I guess have confirmation that you can see my PowerPoint as a slideshow? The first slide is up. Can someone please confirm? I'm assuming, yes. Okay, I, I'm going to begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, and for inviting me. Thank you to the Canadian Red Cross, the Balsili School of International Affairs, Svetlana Agiba of the International Red Cross, professors Ann Fitzgerald, Joanne Weston, and Andrew Thompson, and the technicians and the captioner who make this all possible. And thank you all who are participating this evening. I want to talk tonight about whether human rights treats matter, and in particular, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. I would say that these are not good times for those of us who care about human rights. In the United States and throughout many other parts of the world, we are witnessing continuing attacks on human rights together with threats to core democratic values and the erosion of the social welfare state. I have to say though, although this week here in the United States, some of us are a bit more hopeful. Nonetheless, some scholars call our time now the post-human rights era, given the number of wars that continue to rage, the unprecedented number of refugees and the prolonged suffering of poverty and inequality that continues unabated in this world. There are those who say that the entire human rights regime has failed. I do not agree. While it is true that human rights treaties, like all treaties, have not yet realized their full potential in every country, I argue here tonight that human rights treaties do have positive outcomes. And I make this argument based on the impact of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities known as the CRPD. The CRPD is the first treaty adopted by and for people with disabilities. It is in my view, not only transforming the way the world views people with disabilities, but it is changing state practices. And it is changing the way people with disabilities are allowed and encouraged to participate in societies for the first time really in history. The CRPD is also creating new norms within the international human rights legal system. So in this presentation tonight, I'll begin by situating my argument about the impact of the CRPD within this current debate about the effectiveness of human rights treaties generally. I will then discuss the CRPD to show how it is transforming societies for the betterment of people with and without disabilities. I will also argue that the CRPD has the potential to make a difference in the future development of interna international law generally, including international human rights law and international humanitarian law. 
The question of whether or not treaties make a difference has captured the attention, as I said, of many legal scholars, from legal realists to critical legal theorists. And some scholars hold the view that treaties make no difference at all in state practices. Eric Posner, for example, claims in his book that human rights laws have made no difference in the lives of people around the world. He and, I, he and others point to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the most ratified of all treaties, claiming that it hasn't resulted in child labor, and they point to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which despite widespread ratification too, and an explicit prohibition on violence, has not eliminated violence against women. Similarly, Stephen Hapgood in his book, The End Times of Human Rights argues that human rights themselves, human rights laws themselves are powerless to address the real issues of inequality. Other scholars have tried to show the effect of human rights treaties with quote, concrete evidence. For example, in 2002, a study by Una Hathaway compared the record of about 166 countries in five areas, torture, genocide, access to fair trials, protection of civil liberties, and political representation of women to determine their respective records on compliance with human rights treaties. Based on her, and I'd say albeit limited data from the US State Department reports, Hathaway concluded not only that human rights treaty ratification does not lead to improvements in state practices, but that treaty ratification may actually have an inverse relationship to the human rights record of any country. I and others have criticized Hathaway's study on several grounds, including the fact that her findings do not in any way refute the important role that treaties play in developing human rights norms, nor does her study account for changes that may be the result of improved reporting practices. She also fails to consider, in my view, the steps a country may take to mitigate violations once violations are identified, nor does she consider the role of treaties in mobilizing the public. Other scholars, such as Beth Simmons and Catherine Sinking, have demonstrated the effect of human rights treaties by looking at the effect of treaties over time, not at the magic moment of ratification, which, would have, which was Hathaway's focus. These scholars note that the processes of change, as we know, are gradual and disorderly. It takes time for any law, international or domestic, to be understood, to be applied, and for people to rally behind the, quote, mobilization of its enforcement in the words of Beth Simmons. We can point to the Convention Against Torture, which has resulted in reduced incidents of state-sponsored torture. And we can point to, the, point to CEDAW, which also has resulted in greater employment opportunities for women throughout the world. Similarly, CRS, the CR Convention on the Rights of the Child has brought inoculations as well as education to millions of children, even in the most, re country, most remote countries on earth. It takes time. With respect to my own research on the CRPD, I'm asking not whether the CRPD has eliminated all discrimination and mistreatment of people with disabilities. Rather, as Beth Simmons suggests, I would like to know, quote, what and how has this treaty contributed to the chances that human beings will enjoy their rights more, more fully than would have been the case in the absence of the major human rights treaty, in this case, the CRPD. The next part of my talk will provide a brief background of the CRPD, followed by a discussion of the impact of the treaty on domestic and international law. I hope to illustrate, contrary to the critics of human rights laws, that the CRPD is making a difference in the lives of people with and without disabilities and within the international legal regime. The adoption of the CRPD in 2006 was an enormous accomplishment for people with disabilities and for justice, um, some say, around the world. Oops. Sorry. People with disabilities are the largest minority in the world and perhaps the most invisible too. WHO estimates more than 1 billion people in the world have a disability. And in most countries, about 20% of the population has a disability, but only for now. As the population ages, more people with disabilities will be expected to be among us. And as a colleague of mine once said, we are all actually temporarily abled. In Canada, the 2017 Canadian Disability Survey found, I saw, that one in five or 22% of people ages 15 and over 
that 6.2 million people have one or more disability. We also know that disability can result from disease, medical conditions at birth, accidents, as well as poverty and humanitarian crises, including natural disasters, violence, and war, for refugees, for children and women with disabilities, as well as victims of armed conflicts. The effect of disability can be more devastating than on others. And I wanna mention here that I'm showing slides and some of them have photos. Some of those photos can be disturbing. And in the interest of universal design of access, I also like to describe my photos and my slides. So here on this slide, for example, I have four pictures of, it looks like two children, one holding the other, leaving a war zone, another picture of what the ravages of an earthquake could do, another picture of a young girl with baskets on her head walking in an area that looks like drought, and a young baby who's clearly malnourished. Prior to the CRPD, there were non-binding international documents that addressed the rights of people with disabilities. However, it wasn't until the CRPD that people with disabilities were actually officially recognized as entitled to legal protections under international law. Since the CRPD was introduced, 183 countries, but not the US, have ratified. That's a story for another day, or maybe we can talk about it during the questions. The CRPD was in fact the fastest drafted history, drafted treaty in the history of the UN. The process began in 2001, ended in 2008, and it also had more signatories on its opening day than any other treaty. Once 20 countries ratified it, it came into force quickly in May 2008. Now one could argue, and I did at one point, that a separate treaty for people with disabilities is discriminatory per se. By separating out people with disabilities for their own treaty, doesn't that imply that they're not worthy of protections under all other international human rights treaties? But what became clear to me, to many others, and to the world, is that without a specific, specific treaty, a law, for people with disabilities, they would remain forgotten and invisible as they had before that. People with disabilities throughout the world are ignored not only by the state, but not only by employers and their own family members, but also by mainstream human rights organizations. When Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, for example, visited Soviet prisons in the 1970s, they brought international focus on the plight of political prisoners in these horrible mental hospitals, but they did nothing to help the thousands of people who were labeled as mentally ill, who were forced to remain and eventually died in those very same institutions. The CRPD was needed to make visible people with disabilities. It accomplishes goal, this goal by being one of the most comprehensive treaties ever written. It contains 50 art articles covering all aspects of life. Let's now ask what and how the CRPD is making a difference. It is, in Beth's words, contributing to the chance that human, buying, human beings will enjoy their rights more fully than in the absence of the CRPD. I'll argue now that the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities is already making a difference, although it's not necessarily implemented in every country or any country fully, but it is making a difference in five different areas. And I wanna just point out those five. Number one, I'm gonna talk about how it's changing society's view about people with disabilities, who they are. Two, it's affecting the development of domestic disability laws. Three, it's impacting international human rights norms generally. Four, it contains rigorous reporting and monitoring requirements that may provide a model for future laws. And five, it is also having an impact on international humanitarian law, which is obviously the interest of many of you tonight. The purpose of the CRPD is to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with, dignity, with disabilities and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. These words alone evidence the CRPD's commitment to greater equality and acceptance for people with disabilities around the globe. In support of my argument that the CRPD is making a difference, let's look at these examples. Number one, how is it changing the view of people with disabilities? Well, the first way, is that it's moving us from what we call the medical model to a social or human rights approach to disability. For centuries, people with disabilities have been viewed in need of charity, care, medical treatment, or a cure, 
but not as rights holders, not entitled to equality, dignity, and autonomy. As a result, laws and policies have been written to deprive people with disabilities of equal rights, including their right to legal personhood and equal recognition under the law. Most, if not all countries have exposed people with disabilities to neglect, abuse, segregation, exclusion, discrimination, and worse. Today with COVID-19 even, people with disabilities in the US and elsewhere have suffered and died at much greater numbers than people without disabilities. The CRP was needed and is needed because the international instruments drafted prior to the CRPD didn't go far enough. For example, they proclaim that people with disabilities have a right to live in the community as opposed to institutions, but only quote, to the maximum extent possible. If someone else decides an institution is good for them, then so be it. They're out of sight and they're out of mind. In some countries where I have worked, children who are born with disabilities are not allowed by their parents to be registered at birth. And their parents are often persuaded or forced even to institutionalize them. That's happening still. People with cognitive and psychosocial disabilities are also being denied legal capacity and equal recognition under law. They're not permitted to make decisions about their own lives, about where to live and with whom or what to do each day. So from 2001 to 2006, thousands of men and women with disabilities came to the UN to help draft the CRPD. The first time that the subjects of a treaty were as involved in the process of drafting than ever before. There, they proclaimed that they were no longer willing to accept second-class citizenship. They developed the slogan, nothing about us without us, which affirms their equal status in society, not merely as recipients of services or treatment or charity, but as rights holders. Rejecting the medical or charity model of disability, the CRPD adopts a social human rights approach. That means it places responsibility on society, not the person, on society to remove the physical, attitudinal, and legal barriers that prevent people from fully participating as equal members. Interesting, the CRPD includes no definition of disability. It says in its preamble, disability is an evolving concept and the disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal or environmental barriers that hinders their full and effective participation in society. That is the definition of the social model of disability. Article one continues, persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. But not, nowhere in the definition section is disability included. To have included a definition of disability would have conceded in the minds of the drafters that a problem of disability is within the person, not society. And after this experience at the UN, people with disabilities who helped draft the CIBD returned to their home countries and to began to work for change. Personally, I've had the good fortune and humbling experience to see these efforts firsthand in such diverse countries as Argentina, Egypt, India, Ireland, Israel, Jordan, Kenya, Mexico, Palestine, Portugal, Turkey, South Africa, and Vietnam. Without the CRPD, I would argue, these grassroots organizations and the grassroots global disability rights movement would not have emerged. And without it, implementation of the CRPD would not now be possible. People with disabilities formed organizations, DPOs, disabled persons organizations, they're called, and with allies produced new laws, submitted shadow reports to the CRPD committee. In Kenya and Peru, for example, coalitions of women's groups worked together to enforce protections for women with disabilities, including their right to access justice as victims of domestic violence. Other organizations were by, with whom I work as part of a project with Handicap International, now known as Humanity and Inclusion in several countries, work to advance equity for women and girls with disabilities and to stop violence. These initiatives would not have taken place without the impetus of the CRPD. And they're led in many cases by the women who showed up at the UN to help draft this treaty. Indeed, the very existence of these new TPOs, particularly those led by people with disabilities, would not have been formed to advance their petitions without the CRPD. 
Of course, people with disabilities alone can't force governments to comply with a treaty, no one can. And even in those countries that have ratified the optional protocol, which authorizes a committee, the CRPD committee, to hear complaints, enforcement remains a challenge. But by ensuring a prominent role now for people with disabilities, the CRPD has already changed how societies view people with disabilities and has increased awareness about that potential. To me, that does make a difference. The second way in which I'd argue that the CRPD is making a difference is its impact on the development of domestic legislation. As mentioned above, another way the CRPD is making a difference is the result of these new domestic disability laws. The CRPD covers 50 articles, almost every aspect of life, from accessibility to legal capacity to access to justice and inclusive education. Of the 183 countries that have ratified the CRPD, a growing number, and I'm trying to keep track, a growing number of countries have already begun drafting new laws or amending current laws to comply with the CRPD. I've seen this happen in a variety of diverse countries from Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia to Montenegro, Peru, south of Sudan, Sweden, Tanzania, Turkey, and Vietnam. Other governments are working with disability advocates in Australia, Argentina, Bulgaria, Costa Rica, Colombia, Georgia, Hungary, India, Ireland, Israel, Croatia, etc., to reform their guardianship laws to protect the right of people with disabilities to legal capacity and to provide alternatives to guardianship, such as supported decision making. And I have to say, Canada really is one of the forerunners and leaders in this uh, developing alternatives to guardianship in the form of supported decision-making. Much of that really started in your country. <clears throat> Beth Simmons has written that human rights treaties are casually meaningful to the extent that they empower individuals, groups, or parts of the state, but the real politics of change are likely to occur at the domestic level. That is exactly what we're seeing with respect to the CRPD. But we're also seeing the CRPD's effect on international human rights norms. <clears throat> For the first time in a treaty, the CRPD combines civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights, as well as negative and positive rights within one treaty. Indeed, the CRPD stands for the proposition that all of its articles are entirely interdependent, that civil and political rights cannot be realized unless and until related social, economic, and cultural rights are also ensured. That means that the right to access for justice for people with disabilities cannot be realized unless voting places, courthouses, police stations are made accessible. It means that the right to equality and non-discrimination of people with disabilities in all aspects of life cannot be realized until they also receive rights to accommodations in the workplace, public life, transportation, communication, and so on. Similarly, the CRPD transforms, transforms the rights in the past that have been considered negative rights into positive state obligations. For example, the right to equality must not, on, must not only ensure freedom from restrictions, but it also must ensure the affirmative right to physical and communication access and accommodations. Saying that we don't discriminate against people with disabilities, and my, that my talk, for example, tonight is open to all, that right has no meaning unless we also ensure that people who are deaf, for example, have access to it through CART. The drafters of the CRPD claimed that their goal was to apply existing human rights laws to people with disabilities. They said they didn't intend to create any new human rights, but I do argue that they did. For example, the CRPD recognizes for the first time in any international law document, the right of people to quote, live in the community with choices equal to others, the right to reasonable accommodations, the right to accessibility, the right to community access and the right to inclusive education. South African court, for example, held that to implement the CRPD's right to inclusive education, the government now, now must spend whatever money is necessary to ensure that children with disabilities are educated in inclusive settings. That is, by the way, more than any court in the US has ever said, and maybe in Canada too. These are all new human rights now that are being read and implemented, we hope, in different parts of the world. 
And they're all necessary in order for people with disabilities to realize other rights under the CRPD and other, under other international and domestic laws too. In addition to new rights, the CRPD also introduces new human rights principles, which I've listed here on this slide. <clears throat> Some of the language here may look very familiar to under other international human rights laws that you know, but not all the language is old. Some of it's new. No other human rights treaty has ever referred to independence, respect for differences, or full inclusion and acceptance of disability. That's new. And central to the CRPD is the view that no individual does or should have to be living completely independently and autonomously. Instead, this human rights treaty for the first time recognizes that people may need support, accommodations. Accordingly, there is now a new human right to support, I argue. The fourth area in which I think the CRPD is having enormous impact is providing a model for future treaties regarding rigorous international domestic reporting and monitoring. What you see in front of you here is a slide that didn't reproduce very well, put out by the UN enabled UN um, Office of Disability. And it's showing you the countries throughout the world that have signed, ratified, signed and ratified the CRPD and the optional protocol. We see when we look here that there is potential for enormous application of this treaty around the world. So many countries have signed and committed to its implementation perhaps. But we also know that the reporting and monitoring requirements of most human rights treaties had been referred to as quote, some of the most powerless, underfunded, formulaic, and politically manipulated institutions of the United Nations system. The drafters of the CRPD were well aware of this critique and responded by including in the CRPD the most stringent monitoring and recording, reporting requirements of any human rights treaty to date. The CRPD includes not only requirements for international monitoring, but also detailed requirements regarding national monitoring and reporting. Without a commitment by state parties to implement the convention domestically, international monitoring has little effect. We know that. The CRPD accomplishes this goal in two ways. Number one, by creating an independent coordinating mechanism within the government to facilitate the implementation of the CRPD. And by the way, that mechanism must include mostly people with disabilities. Number two, it also requires data collection, specific data collection about people with disabilities, their lives, as well as the barriers they face in exercising their rights. No such data had been collected before under any other international law. The CRPD is also changing certain international norms regarding monitoring enforcement through the CRPD committee. Unlike in the past when people with disabilities were considered interested parties or the subjects of good work, but never experts, the CRPD makes clear that its committee must consist primarily of people with disabilities, and it does and has. Not only is the composition of the committee unique within the international law system, but, but the CRPD committee itself, based on my research so far, appears to be more active in responding to country reports, thus giving rise to a new responsibility on state parties to more carefully document the information contained in their country reports. I believe that this approach has the potential to raise the bar for other country reporting mechanisms as well. <clears throat> Finally, the CRPD, I believe, has potential to impact the development and effectiveness of international humanitarian law. I'm not an expert in this area, but as I've looked and compared the CRPD with international human right, human to humanitarian legal principles and instruments, I see overlap and I see areas where the humanitarian law can learn and benefit from the CRPD's expertise. We know not only that armed, armed conflicts cause disability, but also that people with disabilities, including children with disabilities, are more often routinely killed, attacked, injured, tortured, 
abandoned and denied access to humanitarian relief and medical care. In a study I did with a former student of mine from Syria about the plight of children with disabilities during the Syrian conflict, that's exactly what we found. Article 11 of the CRPD specifically requires state parties to take all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situations of risk, including situations of armed conflict, humanitarian emergencies, and the occurrence of natural disasters. Article 11 of the CRPD, therefore, for the first time as a matter of international law, requires state parties who have ratified the CRPD to refrain from attacking people with disabilities and requires them to take all necessary steps to provide them with medical, humanitarian assistance, as well as safe and accessible evacuation routes. We see here a comparison between the international human rights CRPD and humanitarian law. We see first that the definitions are different. As I explained, the CRP doesn't have a definition per se for fear of excluding people. Whereas humanitarian law has a very old medical model of disability, referring to people as wounded, sick, infirm. It doesn't approach the human rights approach, doesn't adopt the human rights approach or the social model. And yet the CRPD applies only to state parties, whereas we know humanitarian law applies to states and non-state armed groups. The CRPD prohibits discrimination and much more. And traditionally, humanitarian law prohibits adverse distinction based on many things, including other status, which had been decided to include disability. Data collection and reporting is spelled out in the CRPD, and our hope is that perhaps those data collection and reporting requirements will spur further development of similar provisions in international humanitarian law. In short, the CRPD explicitly guarantees for the first time the obligation of state parties to take steps to ensure the safety of all children and adults during armed conflict in a way that international humanitarian law had not done before. Prior to the CRPD, international humanitarian law protected only wounded and sick people who are entitled to humane treatment and the right for medical care and humanitarian assistance. The first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions relating to the protection of victims of international armed conflict does define wounded and sick persons as who, because of trauma, disease, or other physical or mental disorder or disability, are in need of medical assistance or care and who refrain from any act of hostility. However, this language is based on the medical model, as I said. <clears throat> Since the CRPD, organizations such as the International Red Cross to its credit and others, have begun to recognize that positive measures must be taken to address not only the medical needs of people with disabilities, but also the adaptation of vital services related to water, food, sanitation, shelter, healthcare, rehabilitation, transportation, <clears throat> and continued provision of services required by persons with disabilities, as well as assistance to victims of the use of certain weapons in our conflicts. <clears throat> International humanitarian law principles also require the right to humane treatment and medical care for prisoners, including those who are disabled. And Article 30 of the Third Geneva Convention does require that special facilities shall be afforded for the care to be given to the disabled, in particular to the blind, and for the rehabilitation pending repatriation. And yet, even with the CRPD and these developments in international humanitarian law, in times of armed conflict, children with disabilities are particularly vulnerable and unable to find shelter and food or left to flee on their own to areas of safety. The situation in Syria, which I had been looking at, as I mentioned with a student um, and wrote up some of our findings, it showed us so starkly that while humanitarian relief organizations want to help children and adults with disabilities, they are often ill-equipped to respond to the many needs or even to locate them. In our research about the impact of the conflict in Syria on children with disabilities in particular, we found that children can become targeted victims of war as parties to the conflict ignore rules of war and launch their attacks specifically on schools and hospitals. Deaf children and children with intellectual disabilities are particularly vulnerable to attacks since they can't hear 
or understand what to do in dangerous situations, even, even with warning. Children, as well as adults with physical disabilities too, face additional barriers when they try to escape to safety or cross borders as refugees. And many humanitarian workers are not familiar with the needs uh, and the unique circumstances of people with different types of disabilities. Another major obstacle facing people with disabilities during armed conflict is the lack of medical care. During times of heavy fighting, fighting, we know that doctors are forced to leave hospitals. They run out of supplies. Psychological support too can be in short supply, which can have devastating consequences, especially for children who are separated from their families or who witness death of loved ones. Children with disabilities who are able to leave war zones and escape areas of, safe, uh, areas of safety, including refugee camps in other countries, also continue to suffer. Reports from Syria that we read in, and confirmed indicated that Syrian children who, who had escaped to refugee camps face such horrific living conditions and a dismal future in their minds, leading many of them to commit suicide. As a result of this humanitarian crisis in Syria, together with new attention to people with disabilities, international humanitarian law is responding. I know that many of you may know more about it than I do, and that is the 2016 Charter on Inclusion of People with Disabilities. This new charter seeks to eliminate all forms of discrimination against persons with disabilities in humanitarian policy and programming. It seeks to undertake meaningful consultations with persons with disabilities and their representative organizations in humanitarian program design, implementation, and monitoring. It also seeks to improve quantitative and qualitative data collection on persons with disabilities. It was updated in 2018. As I understand, the UN Security Council now attended its, its first dedicated discussion on the impact of conflicts on persons with disabilities in 2019, there was an interagency standing committee that issued guidelines on inclusion, inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action. These are important initiatives that I believe would not have happened without the adoption of the CRPD in 2006. Sorry. I have argued here that the CRPD is an example of a human rights treaty that is having effect on the development of international as well as domestic legal norms. The photos I have here show individuals with disabilities participating in society, a young woman with Down syndrome at a computer, two children, one in a wheelchair playing, a, young, a man at a desk working on a computer who's sitting in a wheelchair, and another man sitting in a wheelchair cleaning vegetables in his home. There's a young boy who is making a sign <clears throat> for the, you, the word you. And there's a photo of a door that says push to open and discrimination with a slash through it. These are just examples of how these international norms are affecting the lives of people. No treaty, including the CRPD, can solve all the problems of the world. But they need to be given, but such treaties like the CRPD also need to be given credit the problems that they have begun to address, and some successfully. We don't know exactly why each country decided to ratify the treaty. In fact, there are many theories about why countries choose to ratify treaties, <clears throat> why they give up state sovereignty to ratify an international treaty and agree to do what an international community dictates. Perhaps the promise of international prestige or financial aid, or because their neighbors had, is reason good enough. But even in those countries in which the government expected no changes upon their ratification of the CRPD, we are beginning to see changes. And I would add that these changes are being seen in the global South, as well as in quote, more developed Western countries. In fact, it is possible that in those countries which don't have a history of human rights enforcement are seeing more changes and greater implementation of the CRPD than other, quote, more, quote, democratic countries in the global north. It's clear that the CAPD, CRPD will not eradicate all discrimination, mistreatment, or segregation of people with disabilities worldwide. But it is nonetheless significant that countries now have the opportunity to alter their domestic laws and practices to address the many injustices to which people with disabilities have been subjected to 
and to ensure their human rights protections under law. At its core, the CRPD represents a new vision of a social order that not only values differences, but based on disability, but also values the different ways in which people may live, work, act, love, think, walk, talk, make decisions with or without supports. We're expecting that like other treaties, the CRPD will continue to have more signatories and ratifiers. This slide here is showing you the increase in the number of countries who have begun, who have ratified different human rights treaties over time. And clearly more and more countries are ratifying treaties. Again, the topic of why countries do that and whether there's really a relationship between treaty ratification and changes on the ground is a subject of a longer conversation. And my work, my research very much is looking at that. But in the meantime, we know that the CRPD is requiring us to examine our definitions of who belongs in society, who doesn't, as well as our definition of equality itself. Making some adjustments here and there is not enough. And this is a slide that I have shared with my students often that has provoked important discussions in my view. What we see in this slide are three versions of three young boys, say, watching a baseball game. In the first slide on the left, we see that their three boys are standing on the same side box. And one of them actually, or maybe two of them can see over a fence, but the third cannot, even though he's on the same side box. They're all being given equal opportunities to see, right? They all have the same side box. In the second image, we see that the tallest young boy didn't need the box and he can still see over the fence. The middle boy now has the same size box and can see, but the smallest one now has two boxes and he can actually see over the fence. So maybe we like to think that that is providing an accommodation which allows this individual smaller boy to participate in society. But ultimately what's needed and what I think the CRPD really is pushing us towards is to remove the barriers completely, to move towards universal design, and the third picture, I think, shows it almost very well, where there is no longer a firm fence in which you can't see through. There's a fence to protect the spectators, I suppose, as well as the baseball players, but that fence allows anyone to see through it at any time. That's what universal design is about, removing systemic barriers. And that, I think, is what the CRPD can promise, and we'll see if it realizes its promise. I'm gonna conclude and hopefully there'll be some questions and discussion. I'll just conclude by saying that the implementation of the CRPD involves changing how we view people who are considered different. They're different from some idealized able-bodied norm that really doesn't exist. CRPD requires that we all begin to change the very nature and fabric of our societies and maybe even our own attitudes. It requires a reordering of government policies and creating places at the table for new constituencies. I think additional research is needed to show empirically the advances in various countries with respect to specific rights and participation of people with disabilities in society. I am working just on that research right now. Yet we already know that the inclusive drafting process of the CRPD, as well as what it says and how it has been being interpreted in different countries, it, we know now that excluding and mistreating people with disabilities will no longer be tolerated as a matter of international law. So to me, the message of the CRPD is clear. The CRPD must make a difference so that people with disabilities will finally be included and accepted into society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arlene. That was a wonderful keynote presentation. We're all so fortunate to um, be in receipt of your wisdom and your research informed uh, work. Um, I would like to open the floor up now for questions. We've already got some coming in here. And um, perhaps I can start with one which has been written about the impact if any, of the CRPD on the development of international criminal law and institutions like the ICC. Can right. you? So it's not, I will say it's so interesting. The first question is on my list of things I still need to get to, that's it. Um, I will say that the two parts of the answer, number one, 
the CRPD is having a dramatic effect on domestic criminal laws, domestic criminal laws, to the extent that people with disabilities who had been subject to insanity defenses or um, competency issues or even mental health treatment involuntarily, the CRPD and advocates who are using it are informing those drafters and policymakers to rethink some of the principles that they have applied within the criminal law context using some of the principles that I outlined for you tonight. In terms of the ICC, I haven't seen any context in which it's come up, but it will. Um, and all I can say is that it's, if any of you are looking for a research project, it has not been developed and it would be a great topic for anyone beginning to wanting to do some new original research. Thank you very much. I've got another call, uh, question that's come on in, in privately um, about the regional organizations and the yes. view of, so at the moment we're seeing you know, conflict erupt in Ethiopia, for example. So um, this is an internal conflict, but um, commands the attention of organizations like EGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development and uh, the African Union as well, if I could add myself. Could you comment on the extent to which the regional organizations and mechanisms are implementing these provisions? Yeah, one thing I was going to talk about um, tonight that I didn't um, is the role of the regional human rights system generally, um, the European court, the African court, um, and the Inter-American. And in the area of disability rights in particular, and I think potentially this overlap between the CRPD and international humanitarian law, um, the regional courts can play an important role. I know the Inter-American court has been very active in um, reviewing allegations of abuse of people with disabilities, particularly in institutions. They've come out with reports, they have invited testimony, um, and the African Court of People and Human Rights, I think has authored one of the most um, thoughtful and persuasive decisions about the meaning of human rights for people with disabilities um, within the civilian population. The question is, to the extent that these human rights bodies now can become better informed about disability rights, and to the extent that conflicts are going to be including more and more people with disabilities, I think the regional human rights system itself has a role, not to mention the regional organizations, but the court system itself, in terms of uh, looking for redress and providing even remedies. Great, thank you very much. And how, can I just ask a question from, from a personal perspective, building on this last question, to what extent is that trickling down on national law? So right. you've got the international, regional, and, and right down to the national law, but international law, as we all know, is only as good as the national will to implement it. Right, right. I think what's interesting, it's really been the international efforts and then domestic efforts. The regional system, the regional system is, has been slow to address many of these issues. I recently did a search actually with my, a student to see to what extent the CRPD, for example, is being cited in regional human rights court decisions. So they don't, the regional human rights courts don't need the CRPD when they have their own regional treaties and that's what they will cite. But I think more and more we're going to see the influence of these domestic cases, domestic law that has taken and copied some of the CRPD principles into the international, into the regional human rights courts as well. So the short answer, what I'm interested in looking at is this growing body of case law within the regional human rights system that will be looking at the CRPD. We have our, I won't do a whole other talk on this, but there's a, there's a lot to think about there. And we are seeing reference to um, the CRPD principles and articles with respect to the right to vote for people with disabilities, with respect to challenges to guardianship, and in particular with respect to conditions in prisons and um, confinement. So I think that the national law, the international law is affecting development of national laws, and now these national law efforts will be making their way into challenges within the, inter the regional human rights system. Thank you very much. And just building on your work in um, and on Syria, the case study of Syria, to what extent do we know percentages, numbers as to um, the, these, these disabled communities? Because we're seeing a lot of the uh, refugees being able to traverse 
um, long stretches of, 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 of uh, geographical territory, but obviously there are restrictions on, on the groups that your research focuses on. So right. can you share any data or statistics from, yeah, from your yeah. perspective? Um, I'll, I'm happy to share with you and participants the article that we wrote that tried to collect some data. This was about four years ago now. And I just wanna, I don't mean to resist you entirely in terms of numbers, um, but we have to be so careful. Why? People with disabilities, as I said, we're, they're not even counted, okay? They're not counted because they're not there, because they're unable to get to where people are counting, which has been a real critique of the humanitarian relief that they didn't even know if there were people with disabilities. Um, second of all, I think that we have to be careful that even if we do count some people with disabilities, there are many people with invisible disabilities. So, okay, how many people have shown up in our refugee camp? with um, you know, severed legs or in need of mobility assistance. But the psychological effects, the other intellectual issues that would not, they would be unnoticed and not collected in any numbers. So I'm very wary in general of counting about people with disabilities, but particularly in war zones or among refugees um, because of the un total unreliability in that case. I think though, from what I've heard, that humanitarian groups, including International Red Cross and others, um, are working hard to educate their workers, their people on the ground, to do outreach. So we need training and outreach for the workers to identify their needs regarding working with people with disabilities. And that's happening, and that has been happening. And when it does happen, it's happened in other areas of conflict, um, it makes an enormous difference. Um, makes an enormous difference. So mm -hmm. I can send you what I have, it's old now. Um, and the most frightening or disturbing numbers we found, which I alluded to, with the number of young people who had lost their parents, it's, it's heart-wrenching, who felt that they had no hope and began committing suicide um, in numbers. Um, that should never, ever be happening. Um, and we do have some numbers from groups on the ground around that. So I'm happy to provide that as well. Thank you very much. Another question just come in. Um, how has the focus on COVID-19 enhanced or detracted from international humanitarian law and disabled bodies in conflict zones? Um, does it distract us or open new avenues for systemic change? Right, it's a great question. And there's a community of people working hard now to assess the effect of COVID generally including in conflict zones, but also in cities and, low, and in rural areas around the globe. And the Disability Rights Monitoring Group has a project that just released a report that I, I don't know if I'm quick enough, I could pull it up and put it in the chat. Um, but if not, maybe I could send it to you, Anne, and we could distribute it to participants. Um, that is an incredibly comprehensive survey of people with disabilities and the situations of COVID. Now, that survey will be limited because it's likely not going to reach people who are in conflict zones who can't participate in a survey, obviously. But of those groups that have done on the ground, grassroots reaching out, um, there is information about the effect of um, the lack of um, outreach for people with disabilities and what COVID has been bringing. But I wanna say that even in the most quote, you know, calm, I don't know if we can call, maybe we can now, but in, a peaceful country like the United States, let's say, um, in the research regarding the effect of COVID on people with disabilities here, the studies by a colleague of mine actually at Syracuse University found that people with disabilities died at four times greater um, rate than people without disabilities. So just imagine if you're in a, I mean, it's, it's unimaginable what people must be going through. Absolutely. Um, could I ask a, a final question we have here on the United Nations? So you've spoken a lot tonight about um, provisions and conventions and articles, but what about the agencies themselves? You know, we hear in some corners that the UN is, is broken um, at yes. the moment. Uh, are they stumping up as much as um, International Committee for the Red Cross and other NGOs that are well resourced and geared towards these issues? Yeah, um, I haven't studied that, so I can't really speak based on any research, but I'll make two comments. Number one, 
one of the major impacts of the CRPD that I didn't mention was on the UN itself. Now, what do I mean? I mean that when all those thousands of people came from all over the world to work on the CRPD, the UN building was entirely inaccessible. The stairs, entrance, the bathrooms, one or two elevators. As a result of the CRPD over that five year period, you may know that the UN closed down for renovations. Those renovations were specifically a result of the need for a greater accessibility within the building. So that's my first comment about what the UN could do. Well, they could make their own building more accessible. In terms of the agencies, I haven't looked at that really carefully, but part of the reason is that I won't say there's not a lot of hope for the agencies, but so much of my research and so much of, I think, where the action is taking place is in, on the ground in different countries with these DPOs. Now, many of the UN agencies are also supporting those DPOs, which is so important. And I do think that one of the reasons some of the countries did decide to ratify was to get more assistance, including from the UN, not to mention the World Bank and other organizations. Um, but the action, the real initiatives are taking place from what I've seen, and that's in Latin America, Central America, and the African region, as well as the Middle East, is on the ground grassroots organizing. And I think um, critiques about the UN being broken, um, I get it. I think there's a lot of good things that could happen, but clearly the potential hasn't yet been realized. I, I definitely agree with you on that. La last question um, I've got here. How did the Trump administration's reign affect our perception of disabilities worldwide? How long will it take us to repair this damage, if it can be called that? Oh, it can be called that. Um, that's, oh boy. Well, do we have another hour? Because that, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say, oh, three things, I guess I'll say. Number one, for many of us, one of the most exciting things about the Biden acceptance speech the other night was that for the first time in any presidential acceptance speech, when there was a reference to diversity and the importance of diversity, disability was included. None of us ever remember hearing that. There's already a task force. He's already convened a group who's been working on disability policy. That's in contrast to the past four years. And I will say that um, there are many people and many of us are recording, writing, thinking about what has happened. And as many of you may know, um, the president had made fun of a reporter who had a disability. Um, and that mocking of people with disabilities was hurtful beyond the borders of the United States. It resonated throughout the world. And so we, how can we, can we repair the damage? Well, we can include people with disabilities in the upcoming administration, which I'm sure is going to happen. We can focus on, for example, getting um, new policies in the Department of Education where the current um, inhabitor of that office um, removed a lot of protections for children with disabilities in education. And so rather than kind of maybe looking back, I have to say at what didn't happen, we're hopeful that there can be a corrective course that's taken. The other thing I'll say, and again, this is a longer conversation too, but um, President Obama promised when he was running for a president that he would sign the CRPD. And he did that within months of assuming his first term. The Trump administration made, made no attempts to consider moving the CRPD into the Senate. Obama, President Obama had done that, and two times the Senate with a Republican majority refused to ratify the CRPD. Um, I've done a lot of research on that history and why that happened, and I have to say um, it is somewhat unforgivable because the United States had been a leader in disability and was involved in the drafting of the CRPD. Um, but we also know that the United States has one of the worst ratification records of any country in the world. I think you know, fewer than most any other country. So we hope in the future CRPD will be ratified by our Senate, but it was not a priority under the prior administration. Thank you very much, um, Professor Cantor. Wonderful, wonderful keynote, which we all enjoyed. I'd like to now hand over to Svetlana Agiva from the Canadian Red Cross. 
uh, a partner of this event tonight and a, and a real um, leading thrust behind the whole event organization. So Svetlana, over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, um, so my name is Svetlana Ageva, I'm an International Humanitarian Law Advisor at the Canadian Red Cross Society. And I joined this conference from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. And looking at the time, we have unfortunately reached the end of this evening's keynote speech and its question and answer period. And the evening has just flown by. And on behalf of the Canadian Red Cross and all of its partners, I want to give my deepest thanks to Professor Cantor for sharing her time, wisdom, and insights with us this evening. And to our participants at home for tuning in and asking Professor Cantor some excellent and thought-provoking questions. I'm sure everyone benefited from tonight's fascinating keynote address. I would like to remind our viewers that our conference, Disability and International Humanitarian Law, is taking place tomorrow, November 10th, from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And late registrations can be made by going online to the Canadian Red Cross's website, and clicking on the IHL events tab. And then on the November 10th, 2020, Waterloo International Humanitarian Law Conference tab to register. Our annual conference held uh, online this year could not have been possible without our partners, Balsili School of International Affairs, Project Plowshares, University of Waterloo, Peace and Conflict Studies, Conrad Grebel University College at the University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and International Committee of the Red Cross. Other special thank yous go to Professor David Crane, who spoke at our annual IHL Waterloo Conference last year and introduced us to Arlene and Arlene's work as well as original members of the conference organizing committee, Professor Lowell Ewart from University of Waterloo and Professor Edmund Peace from, from Laurier University. Please also know that this evening's speech has been recorded and will be posted to both Paul Silly and Red Cross YouTube channels later this week. And finally, consider evaluating your experience with us tonight by visiting SLEDU and entering event code hashtag IHL Waterloo. We hope to see you all again tomorrow and until then, take care.